Okay, I think uh, we're going. To, I see 40 participants. I'm very happy to have Dr. Brian E. Livesey, the Industry Strategy Challenge Fund Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge Director with us uh, to talk about the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge. Um, as I, I noted before the meeting, I once heard Brian had described as the climate conscience of one of the companies she worked for. I won't, I won't say which company, but <laughs> so I think that's, that's a pretty good recommendation. And thank you very much, Brian, also for really taking a lot of part uh, in the UK CCS Research Centre over the years uh, and helping with the Industrial Advisory Panel. So, a lot for that. Okay, so. <laughs> We put somebody on mute. <laughs> so, Brian, the floor's, floor's yours. Uh, the format for everyone is Brian will, will give the presentation. Um, won't take any uh, questions during that, but we've got lots of time for questions afterwards. So, uh, just save up your questions. If you want to send them as chat, that's fine. But I think we will try and get people to speak and ask the questions as well if we can manage that. Okay, Brian, thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just check everyone can hear me okay? If not, um, just let Carrie well, know through the chat box. Well done, Greg Much. That's terrific. <laughs> yep, we can hear you. Great, thank you. So as uh, John has introduced me, I'm now the director of the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge Fund. And what I'm going to do is just take you through a few basic slides about what the fund is doing and then take the opportunity um, to just um, talk to you about you know, your views, any questions you've got, extra things you might want to know in the future and things like that. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak to you because this is an important, important time for the challenge and we were really looking forward to engaging with a broader group of people at the conference and sadly that can't happen now, but it's great that we got the opportunity at least to have this web-based meeting. So um, if we could move on to the next slide, Karis. I guess the key point I wanted to make about the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge is that its purpose really is to kickstart the decarbonisation of industrial clusters in the UK. So sometimes people make the point of, oh, well, the money you've got, it's a lot, but it isn't enough to completely decarbonise. And we know that, but we also know that um, clusters need to do a lot more work to get ready for major pieces of investment in what they're doing. Um, a lot of engineering design work hasn't been done yet. And the fund that we have is really designed to kickstart that activity and make sure that the clusters can thrive in the long term. So it's, it's, I see it as a really, really important piece of work and it's great that we're able to be um, kicking off the work now. So I'm going to take you through what we're doing, but as an overview of the challenge, we've got the familiar clusters map up on the screen, you know, roughly where these clusters are. Um, and I'm sure most people um, diving into this call will be as well aware as I am of um, why decarbonising clusters has been made a priority. Um, and we really feel that by focusing on decarbonising a cluster rather than a specific industry, we were going to get extra benefits in terms of um, cost reduction within a region and greater efficiencies of the way we do things. So we're trying to transform these regions for the future Make, and we're expecting that in the future they'll look very different from how they look now and obviously heading towards the net zero emissions target really important and we're trying to develop the low carbon technologies and infrastructure which are going to be um, the foundations of decarbonized decarbonization in these heavily industrialized regions. The idea is that we decarbonise industries, but we also make sure that these regions are attractive for future investment. So trying to make sure that by moving on a sensible sort of and fairly rapid timescale, we actually attract inward investment rather than losing jobs. 
We're trying also in the same time scale as, as decarbonizing industry to establish some appropriate research programs to, us, to really support that work and to find new ways of knowledge sharing. And we all know knowledge sharing is important uh, for all kinds of reasons, not least of which is, it is genuinely believed that if we share knowledge, the cost of future projects will decrease. That's a really important goal, but given that we're going to be spending tens of billions of pounds, any decrease we can get must be worthwhile. We're also expecting that through the work that businesses do in the UK, they're going to get the opportunities to export some of their knowledge. And we're going to kickstart all of this um, with our fund, which is already in place and is due to finish by March 2024. So that's the time scale I'm currently working to. So if we have our next slide. Thank you. So I wanted to um, just make sure people recognise that we have the government's industrial clusters mission uh, which has got um, the target of having a decarbonized industrial cluster in the UK around 2030 and a net zero cluster by 2040 and if we could just move on to the next slide uh, within our challenge, we have a remarkably similar mission statement. So this is not by chance. The reason why this is the case is that we're working very, very closely together. So we are really trying to be the early stage delivery partner of the industrial clusters mission as far as um, decarbonizing infrastructure is concerned. And so you'll have seen that the mission itself is um, starting to receive significant amounts of funding now through the budget announcement of an extra 800 million that was in the UK budget a few weeks ago and that will um, help the work that we're doing now in the industrial decarbonisation challenge turn into a much um, deeper piece of work in the slightly longer term. So we are working closely together and that's really important to me for for delivering what we're trying to do and making sure that we, we are delivering on what the government's net zero targets are. So if we could uh, move on to the next slide, Keris. When was it going after you wanting? Thank you. <laughs> That one. Uh, the, I'm just checking that's my next slide. Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> so um, the next few slides take you through an outline of what the challenge um, is doing in terms of how much money it's got, and what we're trying to achieve. So on this side, we've got 170 million pounds of government money. We have a aspiration to get match funding from industry up to the level of about 260 million pounds uh, which means ultimately we'd be delivering about 430 million pounds worth of um, decarbonized industry within this this um, challenge then we've got three strands um, they are all interlinked uh, one is called deployment, which is the major piece of work we're going to do. One is called cluster plans, we used to call it roadmaps, but it's really about plans for a region. And then we have our research and innovation centre. And in each of these, we've had stage one projects um, competed for, and, uh, and then we are about to have stage two competitions to follow on from those. And I'm going to take you through how that will work in a moment. So carries the next slide, please. So first of all, on deployment, we've got 132 million pounds here. Our strong focus is on feed studies. So that's the engineering design studies that need to be done to make sure we have got a good handle on costs. We've got a good handle on what technologies we would use um, and that we understand 
um, that we've got all the right permits in place and where all the investment is coming from and that we understand ultimately how we would want this investment to be operated and funded in the future. It's a huge piece of work to carry out these field studies and for most of the clusters this will be new to them. They haven't done this level of investigation before because there's been no money to do it. And we're trying, of course, to make sure that we're using cost-effective approaches um, and technology that will be useful across the UK. And ultimately, what's really important is that we end up with the designs for the core infrastructure that we need for decarbonisation of a cluster. So this is mainly around what is the um, transport and storage system going to look like and what for CO2 storage and what sorts of extra facilities might we need for hydrogen production and storage, things like that. Um, and of course we need to understand who's going to do all of this and what skills we need. So if we could move on to the next slide, Keris. So next we have our cluster plans. These are interesting bits of work because we recognise that the early stage projects which actually get built um, will probably be involving large industrial organisations that have got the money to pay for it really. But that does not achieve decarbonisation of a whole cluster. A lot of emissions are coming from other smaller regions. And what we really want to do is make sure that we can understand what is the plan for the region. And of course, these plans have been put together before. But what we've seen is that the real on the ground engagement by industry has not been all that evident. And I think what we're really trying to get out of this cluster plan work is that we'll understand what the broader context of the initial projects will be and understand what those initial projects could deliver to the region and how other people might start to engage. So these pieces of work are intended to be quite ambitious. They don't actually have to get built as such, so they can be a little bit more um, novel in their thinking, I suppose. The deployment project actually will be leading to actual deployments. It has to be very realistic. We want the roadmaps to be realistic too, but they can be a little bit more speculative in terms of um, how they might develop in the future. And I think it should be an exciting piece of work. And what we're really hoping for is that they result in real understanding in the region of why that region needs to contribute to decarbonisation of the UK and that people start to understand things like that costs and the benefits to that region which will arise and they will get on board with the plan. Okay, carries the next slide please. And then the third strand is being delivered through EPSRC, it's our new virtual research and innovation centre. Uh, virtual is a word we're using a lot at the moment and I suppose one thing that might come out of this um, situation we're in is that actually it might make having a virtual research centre a little bit easier than it had previously been thought. Anyway, it's called IDRIC currently. The name may change, but we seem to like this. So that stands for the Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre. As I am sure you have all heard, our research centre champion is Mercedes Maroto Vela from Harriet Watt. She's currently working on developing the um, initial plans for the centre, which should be finished by around July this year, and the centre should start operations on the 1st of September in 2020. So I understand from John that you're quite likely to have a more detailed talk on the work of the Centre for Mercedes at some future point in this lecture series. So I won't say too much about it. The only thing I did want to emphasise is that now is a really great time to make sure that you're involved if you want to be. We really want this centre to play a key role in the decarbonisation of the industrial clusters. 
we think that things like knowledge sharing, which have not been very effective in the, in the past, might be facilitated by the interactions between the cluster and IGRIC. That's really important. We want to find new ways to do that. And particularly, when we want to make sure that the centre focuses on what the clusters actually need to help them to thrive in the long term. And that is not just technology development, it is going to be um, significant emphasis on social understanding, policy in that area, economics and, and various other things that are all needed to help a cluster to really um, understand its, its role in the UK system. So there is plenty of chance to still get involved. Uh, please do if you've not already done so and you've got good ideas for what work might be undertaken. And similarly, if you want to get involved in the deployment and roadmaps projects, please do contact um, the project leads in those areas or I can help you to make those contacts. We do plan for the clusters, especially the roadmap projects, to expand as they go into the next phase of the competition. And there is scope for good ideas to still be introduced if people have got those, so please take that opportunity. Next slide, please, Caris. So the timescales we're working to are remarkably consistent across all of these strands, reason being that I thought it'd be a good idea if they all kicked off together. It's actually quite difficult for a research centre to establish itself as important to the clusters if it's going to start operation 12 months later or 12 months in advance. And similarly, developing cluster plans when the deployment project has gone off and done its own thing could be rather difficult. So they are all kicking off on the same time scale. I'm really absolutely delighted that all of our projects started on time on the 1st of April. So that was Monday this week. It's been a huge amount of work to make that happen, especially with the huge amount of disruption there has been to everybody involved in the programme. Uh, so getting those projects kickstarted has been a um, real success. Um, so all of them are on track. Um, the stage two competitions, which are the major pieces of investment. So stage one is only a small amount of money to just build up plans for stage two. Stage two competition will open and it is only open to the successful project from stage one but the number of participating organisations can be increased or decreased. We're a bit flexible about that. Um, we're going to launch that stage two competition before the stage one projects have been completed. Um, and so we're going to be launching them quite soon. Um, reason is we've got a huge amount to deliver before the industrial decarbonisation challenge comes to an end. Uh, we don't want to um, go slow in any way and one of the ways to facilitate this is to start work on the next stage before we finish the previous stage. So that's all going to be um, interesting, especially in these current times. Uh, Carys, if we could move on. Okay, so uh, when John kindly invited me to speak, um, the idea was that I was going to be able to announce the winners of the stage one competition, which um, those of you who follow those things closely will know we haven't yet announced. Um, so uh, the reason for that lack of announcement is that until we've actually got contracts with all of the stage one competition winners, we can't really make a public announcement and it was only on um, Friday last week which was the absolute deadline <laughs> to submit all of the correct forms and everything before the competition launched on 1st of April that we actually got all the documents in place so we couldn't have done anything before Monday anyway um, then we've been in a situation where government, for many, many obvious reasons, is wishing to focus communications on coronavirus-related activity, that it has been um, somewhat difficult to get approval to announce anything at the moment. 
because you know those and, and all the communications teams are, are focusing on other things. However, at about lunchtime today, I did get special approval from BASE that we can actually announce the competition winners. So I have got some new news in that sense. But before I show you the winners, um, and I'm not expecting there to be a complete surprise to many people, I, I would just like to say that we have been asked to just not share that outside this talk today because we haven't let the competition winners um, start to make their own publicity yet and we won't be able to put up, an, put up announcements before Monday next week at the absolute earliest so we still haven't got approval to make um, announcements on our website or anywhere else and until we've done that then the competitions themselves can't start to do their own publicity so if you would just please hold off from sort of engaging with the the funded clusters and, and talking about who they actually are i'd really appreciate that so uh carries if we could move to the next and final slide okay so this is showing you who the winners are of the deployment and cluster plans projects um i'm not going to go into the details of what these projects are because i really think it would be unfair of me to do that. The projects themselves have all got great teams behind them and we really want them to have the opportunity to go out telling people what they're all about. And I'm sure some of them will be speaking in, in this sort of series of talks at some point and I don't want to go into the detail. I suppose what I um, am particularly pleased about is that um, every cluster that submitted a uh, deployment plan and a roadmap has got funding through the competition. It's um, great that we're able to proceed with, with all of them through into the next stage and allow them to develop their plans for more detailed investment. Um, the other thing I would particularly want to mention is that you will see that some of these projects have got huge numbers of partners in them, which is something I was really trying to encourage and I'm very pleased that that has happened. The reason is that particularly in the roadmaps piece of work we were trying to get lots of organisations involved that would be responsible not just for doing the work but for creating an environment in the cluster that would help it to thrive. So if we look as a particular example that might surprise people if you don't happen to come from the Humber region. Um, the Humber roadmap project is being led by whole city council and I'm sure that's almost as much to their surprise as it might be to other people who haven't, haven't seen that before and it really is tremendously pleasing to me that they have kind of stepped forward and said yes we, we've got the convening power in our region to really do something and we'd like like to be involved and I, I think that's tremendous and in many of our roadmaps projects we have got um, local partners who are might be training organizations or industry bodies various different sorts of delivery partners that we haven't seen coming into these competitions before that has made it tremendously difficult for everybody to understand the innovate UK processes and filling the forms and so on. But I think it's really going to strengthen the projects as they move into the future and that they won't just be um, one or two massive industries leading something. It actually will be a big project that's going to be delivered in a context and that the local people will, will get behind that project. And I think that's really important. So that was all I was planning to say. Um, of course, I would like to congratulate all the successful projects and, and we're looking forward to working with them. We've already started that interaction, of course, because they went live on the 1st of April. Um, the other thing I would say in closing is it was my aspiration that we would start to see new collaborations coming out of this competition and that those collaborations would really benefit industrial decarbonisation in the future and I'm really pleased that we are actually seeing this. So one thing that people make a point of saying to me is that you know they are working with people they've never worked with before 
and they're really starting to feel that they can make a difference in their region and they're not just um, operating in isolation. So I think we started something that has got the potential to be uh, really important for the future as a new way of working. And uh, that was all I was going to say and I'm happy to um, try to answer any questions you might have. Back to John. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Brian, that's great. Uh, I'm surprised at the end. Um, so, uh, questions, people. I, I, I think, I don't know whether people have got a hand raising facility. Uh, if not, I think, can you please just make a comment on the chat and I'll follow up on the, on the comment. Uh, so, you've got, got a question, so from, from John. Uh, if I unmute you, John, do you want to ask your question? Someone identified as John, who is now unmuted. You posed a question about Humberside CCS. That's interesting. I'll, I'll ask the question, Brian. So I don't know whether you can answer it, in fact, you perhaps can't, but is the city gate, the hydrogen project included in Humberside? Do you know? I uh, no, it isn't. <laughs> okay, it's not a formal part of the Humberside cluster. Of course, there are strong links um, in terms of thinking about what any hydrogen producer in the region would would deliver to um, other areas. But no, it isn't relying on on lead city gate proceeding. I suppose, sort of by definition, Leeds City is not industry exactly, is it? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's, it's not what we're focusing on. Obviously, that yeah. is a massive project itself, but we're really focused on the um, CCS and hydrogen infrastructure within the sort of clusters that have been identified on that map. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, are they, are they, so they're all doing CCS, are they, you think? Uh, I believe so, yes. Um, obviously some um, regions don't have a, um, um, a particularly viable CCS route other than by ship, but they certainly all recognise the need for a CCS element, yes. Okay, um, so John, John sends apologies, his, his microphone is the background. Um, okay. <laughs> Someone with a noisy baby. Uh, I won't say who it is, but uh, very good. That's, I hope the baby's paying attention. Maybe not interesting. Enough. So we've got a few questions here. Um, what about export uh, industry? Where is that, that figured? Uh, and I guess sort of related to that, have insights from innovation theory been incorporated into the design of the programme? Okay, so... Um the potential to build an export industry um, it is certainly included in the business case for getting the funding to launch this challenge, I suppose. So it is considered, yes, because we are recognising that export opportunities are important, uh, but it is up to the clusters themselves to put together their plans of how they might support that activity. We haven't really been prescriptive about what they might do at this point. Mm. And I mean, how much do you think the, the challenges learned from previous challenges, like the Faraday challenges? Have, have you had any insights from that? I guess you personally would have been on the other side of any of those challenges, but people at Innovate UK will have been. <laughs> Yes, well, um, within the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, of course, Faraday is, is one of our challenges. And of course, they've been um, pioneering many different, um, many different, different ways of working, I suppose. So yes, we all learn from that. We all get together every month and, and talk through ways in which we can help each other. Is that a reasonable answer or do you want more? Well, if there is any more, well, I don't know. I just don't know what more I could yeah. say. No, I, I, we I, I guess it, it, it's, it's, I mean, what, well, maybe, maybe it's a sort of related question, but what about your metrics for success? And uh, have those been informed by previous challenges? Do you think? 
Um, 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 um. Yes, I suppose so. I mean, I guess across the whole of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, which is a massive multi-billion pound investment, as people will recognise, there is a huge amount of, intent, of attention on evaluation of the programme and on something called benefits realisation, which I wasn't previously particularly familiar with. So we have massive sheets of, you know, here's all the benefits we think we will deliver by day X and how they're going to be delivered and how they'll be tracked and what the point of them all is and so on. And those are um, seriously scrutinised and then we will have a separate programme evaluation by an external consultant that will look at, you know, the key metrics of the programme once those have been established and whether we have actually delivered what we set out to deliver. So there is a huge amount of oversight to make sure that um, the projects we fund do deliver what we aspire for them to deliver. Um, the metrics themselves have not yet been finally decided because we're we're working on that now but um, the evaluation program will start pretty soon within the next three months so we have to decide before then. Yeah I, I guess they might change in the present circumstances. Stuart's going to ask a question about that. Um, I'm trying to unmute you Stuart. I yeah. unmuted myself. <laughs> um, obviously we're in a sort of close down at the moment and uh, People in big industries are probably losing money rather than making money. Mm. So I'm wondering if there's any, if it's too soon or if there's any thought gone into what degree of co-funding may or may not be required because originally there was magic numbers of two pounds or five pounds for businesses for every uh, every one of industry and that might be more difficult to achieve that's all. So it's not a trick question I'm just wondering uh, you know have you have you got that far yet? Uh, yes, um, not to having an answer, but obviously discussions have started. Um, across everything that UKRI is involved in, there are issues, of course, um, around delivery. I think, rightly or wrongly, I have made strenuous efforts to make sure our challenge is not paused or put on hold in any way. <laughs> So we are carrying on, on with our original timescales and the reason for that is that we're trying to deliver something that's important to deliver on time and uh, because our challenge feeds into various other activities in days we all need to keep in step and so we are continuing with that and we have had um, uh, confirmation from base that this is what they want to happen and that they are still focused very much on um, climate related activities and you know, I think that's really improving. On the downside of that we recognise that industries are not in a great state so um, if they struggle to raise the match funding we have been um, aspiring to get <laughs> then we'll have to address that in some way and if, I, I don't know what the situation will be because some industries do not feel that they're going to be negatively affected in that way and others obviously do but we are having the conversations and we're trying to be um, as flexible as we can. I think in terms of delivering the first stage of the programme we're at least in the fortunate situation that everything is paper-based work and would probably be it been done um, without too many large meetings and so on needing to take place. So I think the clusters themselves are pretty confident they can deliver stage one in the current circumstances and deliver their proposals into stage two. But the funding is an issue that we've started discussions about, I suppose, as we think. Thanks, Ronnie. Fair enough. You know, I'm going to guess that uh, it'll just it'll impact more on smaller companies and SMEs who don't have so much cushion, of course. So, 
Yeah, and what we're seeing is that um, particularly with SMEs on Innovate UK funded programmes, there is a tremendous amount of flexibility being introduced into the system to help them because um, losing some of those key SMEs would be a terrible thing. And, uh, you know, there are things being put in place to um, you know, get funding to them. I mean, the, the organisation itself has launched its new coronavirus related competition today, which is yeah. 20, million, 20 million pounds. We'll give you up to 50,000 pounds and you get the money up front. And then they couldn't be really more flexible on that one. It'd be lovely to have that one to still do part of my meeting too, but that's not so lovely. Good. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks. Um, so keep the questions coming in. I, I, I've got one here on, I guess, on brand recognition, Bryony. Um, so what's the, what's the st status of some projects that were previously well known? So Acorn, Grangemouth and Teesside. Are those, okay. are those, are those bur buried in snoozy? <laughs> One of the, the Scottish projects. Yes, uh, yes, the Scottish, um, well, in the case of the deployment project, that's basically the ACORN project. Um, in, the case of, in the case of the roadmap project, then it's the much broader piece of work that includes a lot of other industries and particularly brings in the Grange Mouth based businesses. And Teesside? And Teesside is now called um, Net Zero Teesside Project in the Deployment Strand in Net Zero Tees Valley. But it's all the same people as you'll see when they announce it. it there's no new, there's nobody involved that would be a total surprise, I suppose. Um, so you can see on the roadmaps that it's Tees Valley Combined Authority leading that roadmap work as you might expect. And on the deployment project, then as is widely known, of course, OGCI Climate Investments have been leading that. And when we get into stage two, that will move to a group of, of oil companies. Okay. Um, so I've got a, a question really. Um, there was no practical work put in because I think there was some possibility for that, wasn't there, in the in the deployment strand? But it, as you say, it's all paper based. The work now, there's no nobody's doing a test injection or anything like that. Well, the stage one funding was really a very small amount of money. I don't think anyone. Yeah. But for stage two, do you think? Do you think it's all... Well, stage two. Um, it may be that things like that end up in people's plans. I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, okay. I, we're not suggesting at all that there will be no construction, no no physical stuff coming out of this. All, all I'm saying is that normally your sort of engineering studies have to come first. And if you've already got as far as you need to get with those then maybe some projects are closer to actually being able to do something than others so so construction -y bits um physical bits are not ruled out they will all be appearing in the in the allowable scope of work for stage two but realistically most projects need to get some serious and done. yes um another question coming in that uh, people can't, can't. Um, what about the business models? How, how does that tie in? Because companies going for feed will ideally like to know that they can get the rest of it covered because they, they may get the feed study covered, obviously, but not the, not the subsequent costs of the project. Yes, uh, the, the interaction with the business models is a concern to a lot of people. Uh, we're very aware of that, of course. And we recognise that the business models need to be in place, or at least people need to be confident that they really will be in place soon. Um, so at the moment, we recognise they will be bidding into the stage two pot of money without those business models being there. But as I'm sure you can imagine, the projects themselves are having extensive discussions with those to try to satisfy themselves of what the future might look like. 
Yes. And they and then, themselves are very minded to um, do things without rushing into something that would be not appropriate, but, but they recognise that this is important as well. Yes, and another part of the same question, what about the 800 million that was in the budget? Uh, how does that uh, factor into things, do you think? Uh, well, these are, I think, trying to um, work through the options of how that money might be spent, but it's real money and, uh, and uh, you know, they, they, do have, they do plan to spend it on... Um, on uh, the next stage of um, project funding for clusters that come out of our industrial decarbonisation challenge. That's my understanding. So we, we know it's intended for CCS in clusters and um, we know it's intended for at least two sites and at least £800 million. Pounds. So, I mean, we have discussed how things might link but um, there's a lot of things to think through. All we know is you know, they've got the money and they ask them to, to think about how it might best be used. Yeah. Yes, and then where the next stage of money after that is going to come from, which of course, you know, 800 million is a lot, but it, it's widely understood that that's just the start of the investment, not the end. Yeah, well, I mean, the next stage could be the business models. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. And how much, um, another question, how, how much utilisation do you think is appearing in here? We, you mentioned carbon capture and storage. It's up to the clusters really. Um, I think realistically the utilisation is going to appear in the roadmaps projects. Um, in terms of the uh, deployment projects, it's up to the um, organisations involved in the cluster that most of them are thinking about um, 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 the sort of big scale infrastructure that they need this funding for, so if that would be the case. We're not trying to, um, we're not trying to use money for things that it is expected would be funded from other parts of money. So because right. Dave has the Industrial Energy Transformation Fund and various other funds available to spend, um, then some of those um, ideas that are not really um, whole cluster ideas as well, uh, might be funded appropriately through another route. I mean, I'm not, not at all saying that they would be ruled at what I mean, if a cluster wanted to start designing infrastructure um, with utilisation in mind, of course, they're more than welcome to do that, and it would be it would be absolutely fine and not ruled out in any way. It's just that realistically, the deployment project is about big scale infrastructure and what that's going to deliver to the region, rather than um, some small smaller scale impact in the near term. I suppose. Yeah, so Jennifer sort of had a follow up comment on that. Jennifer? Hi. Um, if you're not really anticipating a lot of utilisation, which is what I took from your answer, and sorry if I've misunderstood, um, are you expecting then that all of the CO2 captured from all the clusters will be stored either locally or underground or in the disused oil wells and in the disused gas fields then? I'm not suggesting that's the case. All I'm suggesting is that within the cluster as a whole, then we would certainly see that in some clusters, then utilisation might be something they wish to improve. It's just not, um, it's just not the first moving project, I don't think. Okay. So I think what we're it's not suggesting that some CO2 could not be accessed and taken off for some other purpose and that can all be designed in if the cluster wishes to do that. Um, and, and there is nothing to discourage that happening. All I'm suggesting is that um, the prime um, objective is to think about decarbonising major industries within those clusters and thinking about Okay, sorry, it's maybe a different question then. Um, you're anticipating from your first slide, 
it's about 33 megatons of carbon dioxide that will be captured as a total from the industrial clusters. So have we got space to store all of that carbon dioxide? Have we got space to store all of that carbon dioxide somewhere? Uh, well, we believe so, yes. Uh, okay. that, that, and Stuart will maybe answer your question better than me. But yeah, I, I don't think it's really an issue. It's not about can we, it's, it's, it's you know, what makes most sense for the region. And I think there is, they are all expecting that there will be uh, more than adequate storage available. Um, and if they can use some of that CO2 for something that makes um, makes sense in a business context, then there is nothing stopping them doing that. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, the industrial cluster as a whole to achieve net zero will need these large scale infrastructure in place, and there's no other source of money to pay for the design of that. Whereas there are many other sources of funding coming along to pay for um, other specific industry related activities. I think. Just follow on, Stuart, do you want to comment on, on how much storage? I guess that's, is that 33 million tonnes a year that we're talking about? I think, isn't, isn't well, it? it would be eventually, yeah. But we build up to that. So there's a, of course, the key thing is to get started. <laughs> with the first million tonnes and so we know that uh, Norwegian projects have been storing one million tonnes a year since 1996 so we just have to, in a way to replicate that but both Norway and the UK have surveyed their offshore storage options very extensively two or three times now because there's a huge amount of data there from the hydrocarbon exploitation industry so we're a uniquely advantaged position in the UK and Norway to have a very excellent database which we can repurpose for CO2 storage and in simple terms the numbers we usually go with is something like 70 or 80 billion tons that's the gigatons of CO2 um, in each of the UK offshore and the Norwegian offshore uh, that's not a investable number if you were to treat it truly commercially as a bank investor but that's uh, a number which you could say has got a 50 percent probability so it's highly likely to survive investigation. So we, we, certainly, we certainly got enough storage for foreseeable future oh yeah we've got, but the other factor is of course for a project starting off you need to have the storage assured for the lifetime of the project. So you, before you'll get final investment decision off the management, you need to have 30, three zero years of storage in prospect. Otherwise you're just wasting your investment. But this should be uh, very, very deliverable. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, there's the options of regional storage connected to each region uh, in the sustaining regime. But in the transition point, then there's options for making shipping transport around the coast for a million tons a year or two million tons a year from one cluster into storage based around another cluster. So we could bootstrap the UK multiple clusters into existence without all the storage sites, but using ship, shipping as a, as a bridge or an interim uh, movement. Is that okay, Bryony? Yes, brilliant. Thank you. Right. Okay, so uh, I'll just ask Louise. Louise was asking what 50% meant, so. Um, well, the underground has, never has 100% certainty. So when you survey the underground, uh, you're usually using incomplete information from one borehole or five boreholes, it, which is effectively uh, surveying the area of a storage site which might be the size of a city like Edinburgh. So if you imagine having five cameras on five lamp posts in Edinburgh and having a good look around there's quite a lot of uncertainty left and that's what that 50% probability is a way of describing that you could have uh, a probability of significantly more storage or you could have a probability of significantly less storage. But as you go through any evaluation of the underground, exactly in the same way as we've developed decades of experience with oil and gas um, 
sites, then that uncertainty reduces and reduces and reduces as you get more and more information. So what you need at the start is enough of a, of a range there to be sure, uh, to be 50% probable that you're going to deliver at least as much storage as you need for the project. Okay. Yeah, I see. Thank you, Stuart. So I guess something that's come up related to that, um, then, Brian, if clusters are sharing assets like storage and shipping to each other, are they going to be in competition or, or collaboration? <laughs> I'm not sure at this point. They, um, I don't think we're trying to, we understand, let's start again. We understand that there have been issues around competition in the past and people are genuinely trying to operate in a more collaborative way, subject of course to their projects being funded. Um, exactly how collaborative they feel they can be is not completely clear, but um, I don't think that um, if a project's only got a shipping option and they're planning to ship to some other customer, I, I don't think the other customer would see that as a competitive situation. I think they're willing to um, talk about, you know, how that might all work. At least that's what I've seen so far. Yeah. I think part of the problem with the competition before was that it was, there were some rules that said that competitors couldn't talk to other competitors or anybody. Uh, yes, yes, well, we're not in that. Have for breakfast or you name it. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the good things about working through this sort of eight UK way of working rather than previous competition is that those kinds of arrangements are not in place at all. Um, so if people want to talk to other people, they can do. I mean, obviously they've got to put in a bid at the end of the day and, and so there's a limit to what you want to say, but there's nothing that stops um, useful conversations from happening and I think that is very positive. That's very, very good. Uh, and so, a question, when you took this job on, um, what, what has uh, surprised you most about uh, what, what, what did you least expect and, and perhaps most enjoy? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I thought you were going to say when you took this job on, how on earth did you get it? I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I... I I enjoy just about everything about it actually because I think the chance to be involved in something which looks like it's really happening is something a lot of people who've been involved in this space for a long time would really envy. I think also, so I, I enjoy most aspects. I think um, the thing that surprised me I think is the real willingness of the clusters to start engaging in broader issues. So when I first started talking to some of the, um, you know, the big projects that would be, you know, looking towards, um, you know, building a big facility and so on, you know, they were not really very um, interested in what was going on in the broader region. And I think what we have tried really hard is to make people understand that if we build some big amount of infrastructure, it's for the purpose of decarbonising the whole cluster and that we need to understand how that is going to feed into the wider region. And I think people have been tremendously responsive to that. It's made them do a lot of new work, made a lot of new relationships. And, and although it was kind of a hassle for them, I think they are starting to feel much more um, sort of secure that they are delivering something useful to the region, which I think is all good. So, so it's quite surprising that we've made a real change in a fairly small space of time. Yes, yes, very good. And th and then, so by the end of the challenge, the challenge ends in like 2024. Is that right? Yes. So where do you think we'll be by by by? It really is March 2024. That's four, four years' time from now, isn't it? Mm. Well, you know, government has an aspiration to have the first deeply decarbonised industrial cluster in place by 2030. So I'm sure we will have a plan in place for making that happen. Yeah. 
to do good. Um, and of course, um, they don't plan to just have one crystal, so there should be more than one, one crystal in that position. And then I would hope that um, the other regions can see a way forward, um, you know, towards um, you know, what their track to um, decarbonisation looks like, and so everyone's got a sort of credible plan that looks investable. That I hope. Yeah. Okay, well, well, we'll ask you back in four years' time to <laughs> see where that goes. So, does anybody else have any other anything else they want to raise? Okay. Well, that's very, very comprehensive. I think everybody's very pleased to see that we've got all the clusters, well, apart from Southampton, um, filled in uh, and things going ahead uh, and everything happening. Um, and I, I, I guess you know, the challenge for everybody probably will be getting something that's uh, shovel ready for post virus stimulus. That would be the, the real challenge. Um, yeah. Which is, if we can pull it off, will be a good challenge. Yes, no, I think it's, um, you know, we're starting to see a lot of discussion around, you know, what more can be done before COP happens next year. Um, to really paint a picture of what the future might look like. So it's given us quite a good chance to to really put forward a good case based on actual funded projects, I think, which is, is good. Yes, yes. Well, I, I mean, as we discussed earlier, that that will depend a bit on the business models and the 800 million. A lot of, lot of useful building blocks to put together there. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you, you certainly put the cat among the pigeons by making uh, making everybody uh, apply for phase one because otherwise they wouldn't be eligible for phase two. So I, I think we've we've seen a remarkable amount of success so far. So I'm sure everybody join me in congratulating you on the on getting everything going. Thank you. That's great to know. No, it's uh, I mean. Really, especially in the circumstances, it's hard to imagine how things would be any any better than they are, isn't it? Really, you've got a large number of projects for a small amount of money, a lot of people engaged. So, very very good. So, thank you very much, Bryony, and and thank you very much, everyone, for coming on the call. And thank you all too. Thanks. Have a good weekend, and the program for next week will be advertised in the usual way. <laughs>